It's Richard Ellis Talks with founding pastor of Reunion Church in the heart of downtown Dallas, Richard Ellis. Whether you find yourself in a good place or a difficult place, perhaps even in a very lonely place, you've come to the right place, a place to hear that you matter, to hear that you're loved, and that's something everyone desperately needs to hear. Now, if you're not able to enjoy today's entire program, just go to the website, richardellistalks.com. All of these video talks plus hundreds of audio talks are waiting to encourage you, challenge you, and to give you hope at richardellistalks.com. So with today's talk, here's Richard Ellis. The title of today's message is Bigfoot. So Bigfoot, Sasquatch, hairy uh, supposed animal on two feet, sightings everywhere, nobody can find him, nobody can capture him, no bones, no nothing. So it probably does not exist, it's a hoax, it's a spoof, Bigfoot. So I'm going to talk to you about a, a, another Bigfoot that does exist. So let's start with Psalm 141. Uh, this may not all be pleasant. That's okay too. It's all going to be scripture. Psalm 141, verse 3. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. So why do you think a psalm like that's in the Bible? Uh, now, I understand we got germs in the world's a crazy place right now, but I'm going to ask you to stick your tongue out. Stick your tongue out. Come on now, cooperate. Let's do this. And grab it. Right? That right there is one of your biggest problems right there. <laughs> that little muscle piece of meat gets more people in more trouble than almost anything on the planet. That tiny little thing in your mouth. You think, oh, no, it's not all trouble. I taste things with it. You do some talking with it, too. I do some talking with it. And there are things that if you can, if you can just keep whatever is right there on the tip of your tongue, if you can just figure out a way to do that, say, God, set a guard. Literally have someone guarding my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. So usually doors open this way, this door opens this way. And the psalmist is saying, God, I need help. Because if these lips open and what's in there potentially comes out, I'm in trouble, everybody's in trouble. Proverbs 12, a few pages to the right, verse 18. There is one who speaks like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise promotes health. So one person speaks, and it is literally like someone taking a sword and shoving it in your body. And that's how powerful and painful words can be. But on the other hand, but the tongue of the wise promotes health. So it's not taking life, it's giving life. The truthful lip shall be established forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. The truth lasts forever. A lie, just that little moment of satisfaction. Um, I am actually stunned at the amount of lying going on around in the world today. People just make stuff up to make themselves look better, think that no one will ever ask a question, never going to check it. Uh, whether it's lying about, you know, where you went to school or credentials for a job, whatever it may be, just make it up as you go because nobody cares. As it turns out, people do care and there's consequence, right? But the stuff that comes out of your mouth either kills or promotes health. Um, either it's truth or it's a lie. Go to Proverbs 15:4. Just the contrast here. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. Um, 
I, I have to hold my tongue sometimes watching people with their kids in public and the things that parents and people say to children. And you're just like, have you lost your mind? You are crushing this child. You are, you are pounding them down. You're telling them terrible things. You say, well, I'm trying to correct them. No, you're trying to crush them in your attempt to correct them. And I'll get in a minute to why a parent or a person is able to even say those kind of things to a child. Proverbs 17, 9. 17, 9 says this, he who covers a transgression seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates friends. Now, this is the phrase we use, and there's other ways you can say this. Keep your mouth shut. When someone shares something with you, uh, and I try to be very, I would be completely out of work. The things that people tell me, if I repeat them, I'm dead. Because there's some things I hear no one else on the planet has ever heard. That person told me and that's it. So if it gets out, I'm the only, I'm the only person. Unless they told someone else, if they didn't, they know it was me. So what can happen? According to this verse, if he who covers a transgression seeks love. So you say, okay, I heard what you said. Done. I heard it. It's resolved. But he who repeats a matter separates friends. So all of a sudden... You know, I told you something in confidence and you went and told that other person. And now friends, people that were genuinely friends are not friends anymore because you, be, you betrayed, I betrayed a confidence. Keep your mouth shut when someone tells you something. Now you say, well, why would you people repeat things they're not supposed to repeat? We'll get to those verses in a minute. Proverbs 17, 27. He who has knowledge spares his words, and a man of understanding is of a calm spirit. Even a fool is counted wise when he holds his peace. When he shuts his lips, he is considered perceptive. So now you've been around this person before, and you're looking at him thinking, wow, this guy seems very, very impressive, right? And you look and think, well, what is it? And they don't say much. They just look at you and seem very sophisticated, very calm. If they would just keep their mouth shut, that would be your last thought. Then they open their mouth. And you go, oh, well, that was wrong. You say, you're judging them. I'm going to give you verses on all of this. Right? So even a fool, it says, someone who's a complete buffoon, if he keeps his mouth shut, she keeps her mouth shut, comes across as wise, but sooner or later, we can't contain ourselves. Proverbs 18, 20. This is very fascinating. 18, 20. A man's stomach shall be satisfied, satisfied from the fruit of his mouth. From the produce of his lips, he shall be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. So what in the world does it mean a man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth? You can lose a job over foolishness that you can't keep from coming out of your mouth. Had a conversation yesterday with a guy who has a, a, an employee. The guy went into the office, some women in the office, and he is upset, and he starts dropping F-bombs and just lights the place up. You cannot keep a person like that around but so long. And a lot of times the person who keeps a person around like that is that person as well. Because you have a hard time saying, I'm going to get rid of you when you know that's me. Proverbs 21, 23. Whoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from troubles. All right, turn to Matthew chapter 12. Now, what I'm about to share with you, I'm reading you some verses out of the Old Testament. I'm about to read you some stuff out of the New Testament. This is profoundly simple, but almost impossible to change. Matthew 12, verse 33. Either make the tree good and its 
fruit good or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. Okay? So, you, people that say, well, you're, you're judging people. You, you, you say this person is this or that. Right? How in the world can you call it judging a tree when you walk up to a tree and you examine the tree and you see apples hanging from the tree and you say apple tree. Oh, no, you can't judge. See, you think that's the dumbest thing in the world to judge an apple tree for being an apple tree because that makes total sense. What we don't like is when someone walks up to us and looks at our life and based on the fruit of our life, we, they call it. You say, well, you can't judge me. I got nothing else to judge it by but, but, the, but the fruit hanging on your tree. Well, you still can't because that's not really who I am. I got some verses on that. And here he's talking to the Pharisees, the religious rulers, verse 34, brood of vipers. Now, this is very fascinating because here we're talking about words, and Jesus calls them a brood of vipers, snakes. How can you, being evil, speak good things? So that's his question to them. And what's he just called them? Evil. Why did he call them evil? Because they're evil. How does he know they're evil? Because that's the fruit on the tree. And then the next phrase. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now, it is possible for a person that is evil inside, sick inside, depraved inside, nasty, dirty, filthy inside to cover for a little while. They can go into situations and act like that's not who they are. But I'm going to tell you what will happen sooner or later. Out of the abundance of the heart, what does it say? The mouth speaks. You stay with that person long enough, and whoever they really are in their heart is going to come right out their mouth. It is impossible to stop. Because it's the abundance of what's in their heart. There's more than enough in their heart, more than enough hatred, anger, evil, whatever is the abundance is in their heart. They cannot contain themselves. And if you just stay quiet long enough and watch them long enough and listen long enough, you're going to hear their heart. You don't, you don't need a stethoscope. You just stand back and listen. You don't have to go examine their heart. You say, well, you're, you're being judgmental. I'm telling you, this is not judgment. This is just observation. The reason we think it's, we, we call it judgment, we don't like this, we don't want people judging because we don't like who we are, and if that's who we are, we don't want people calling us who we are. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good things, and an evil man, out of the evil treasure, brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word man may, men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Then some of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want, to seek a sign. we want to see a sign from you. What did they do? Change the subject. We don't want to talk about what you're talking about. Let's talk about something else, not about how we talk and who we really are. Matthew 15, a few pages to the right. Verse 10, when he had called the multitude to himself, he said to them, hear and understand, not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. So they were worried about what you're eating. He's saying it's not what you're eating that's defiling you. It's not what you're putting in your body that's defiling you. It's what's coming out of your mouth that's defiling. That's, that's what shows who you really are and where you really are. And then slowly but surely, the Holy Spirit, because he's changed their heart, changes their mouth. How many of you ex have experienced this somewhere along the way in your life? Raise your hand. Okay. Okay. 
Luke 6. Similar thing. This is in Mark as well. I'm going to read it out of Luke. Luke 6, 43. For a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. Now you say, well, this is very good information because now as I go through the world and I observe people and the way they speak, I can now know where their heart is. I'm not, talking about, I'm not even there yet. I'm talking about my heart, your heart. Don't be jumping to all the other people in the world. Roll some tape on you. Roll some tape on me. Let me hear what comes out of my mouth. James 1, 19. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. James 3, a few more and we're done. James 3, verse 1. My brethren, written to Christians, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, okay, and this is another category. If a person does not stumble with their words, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. So here's what you find out. A person who can control, is their words are reflective of what's in their heart, then there's, an, there's a good indication that they're self-controlled in other areas of their lives physically. A person who is out of control with their mouth, there's a good chance they're out of control somewhere else, sexually, addiction, whatever it may be. Some, something's wrong. Because if that's what's in their heart, what's in their heart is going to affect the rest of their life, not just what's coming out of their mouth. But if you meet someone and you follow them around consistently, and as it's described here, does not stumble in word, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. So something is working like you'd rarely see when that's the case. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and, and boast great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. Where does the fire that the tongue creates come from? From hell itself. So let me talk to single people just a second. You meet some guy, you're a girl, you're a godly woman trying to find a husband. If what is coming out of his mouth is foul, what is in his heart is foul. And you say, well, but I love him and I'm going to change him. Only God can change a heart. I encourage girls, you say you met the guy then you, let, you turn him over to all your godly friends. We'll find out who he is. And then the reverse is the same. Some guy says, oh, I met this amazing girl. You turn her over to all your godly friends that are females and let them tell you whether she's the real deal or not. Because men and women play games with each other. Women don't play games with each other. And men don't play games. Especially if they know the woman that's, that, that the guy's trying to... Whatever. So... So keep reading. 
set on fire by hell. Verse 7, for every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. Now, what did it just say? No man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our God and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? And the answer is no. Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. So unless you change the source, whatever's in the source is going to come out of the opening. And this is the opening. James 4, let me read you this really quick. James 4, 11. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? In other words, speaking evil of someone. You say, well, what's the difference in speaking evil of someone and observing their fruit? You're just calling it what it is. But let me tell you something else about observing fruit. If you observe the fruit and you really care about the person, they're going to pick up on that. Because you're not judging them. You're not trying to sentence them to something. You're saying, look, dude, you've been, you've been a Christian a long time. What's up with this? It's GD this, F and this, B, she's a B. It's, you know. Bada bing, bada boom. And there's no end to this. Like, what's up, dude? Last one, 1 Peter 3.10. Simple verses, so profound. For he who would love life and seek good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. What are most people looking for? They want to love life and see good days. A ton of that goal and that happening, being accomplished in your life, is tied to what you say. Love life, see good days. Let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. turns out the Bigfoot is not some elusive hairy monster roaming the backwoods. It's an all too real monster that we insert in our mouths too often that reveals what is in our hearts and create a world of trouble. The closer you get to Jesus, the more time your feet will be firmly planted on the ground instead of shoved in your mouth. And then words like the L word and the J word start coming out. Anybody know what the J word is? Jesus. It's very fascinating to me on the other end of this scale. If you if you follow people around, there's something else. If it's a Jesus tree, you're gonna see Jesus fruit, and sooner or later you're going to hear his sweet name. Because if the abundance of your heart is Jesus, you cannot help but speak his praises. You cannot help but speak his name. So if you don't hear his name coming out of your mouth very often, something may be wrong. There's a song called The Blessing. And there's a refrain. And it was on the radio the other day, riding down the road with my wife. And I don't even know if she noticed this. But there's this repeating refrain, he is for you, 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 he is for you. And that welled up inside of me and I, and I couldn't even, I couldn't contain it. You know why? Because I know that's true. And what does the devil tell you? He's against you, he's against you, he's against you, he's against you. There's no hope. You should be afraid. He can't save you. He can't rescue you. 
But the scriptures, you read the scriptures, you fill your heart, you fill your mind, you fill your life with him, and eventually, out of the abundance of that full heart, he comes out. And that's how people know you're a Christian. Because they finally hear your heart that can't contain it anymore. Your mouth must speak of his praises and his glory. And our Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for an occasional big foot that gets planted in our rear ends to help us wake up. And I understand some of these things are intense and cultural. Uh, yes, we all have culture, Lord, but we are Christians. And if that's not the primary thing, then we got a problem. So I pray that we would all be willing to be cha challenged no matter where we come from and that, Holy Spirit, you would move through our hearts and minds and reveal to us what is there, although we already have a good indication based on what we hear coming out of our mouths. Father, for people who realize there is no hope without you and the J word is the only word they now know that's going to save them, and they would be willing to say, God, I am a sinner. I need your forgiveness. I do see now and understand that Jesus died on a cross, was buried and raised from the dead, shed his blood to pay for my sin, and he's offering me the forgiveness of my sin, the gift of eternal life, free of charge. I accept. I receive the gift of eternal life. I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus. I believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead. Save me. Thank you for saving people in this room and beyond right now, and that it is that simple. Although the most priceless gift ever offered, it is that simple. Father, give us patience with each other and patience with them as you change that heart to your heart, as you change that mind to the mind of Christ. And then as the heart changes, what comes out of the mouth changes as well. Um, and for those of us, Lord, who know you, and unfortunately, there's really not enough fruit on the tree to prove it, especially what comes out of our mouths too many times. It's creating us a new heart, a clean heart. And then let that be obvious to us and everyone else by what comes out of our lips. Praises to you, encouragement to others. and gratitude for coming after us. You're the best. Thank you for being for us, not against us. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We'd love to keep this conversation going with you anytime on the website richardellistalks.com. There you'll find the full version of today's talk, plus hundreds more of Richard's challenging and encouraging audio and video talks. Then discover over a thousand cities where Richard Ellis Talks is broadcast. Or you can share a request on the prayer wall. Plus, if you'd like to consider a gift, learn how to join the financial partnership team and so much more at richardellistalks.com. So let's meet again here next time to talk about how God is ready to change your life starting today with Richard Ellis Talks.